I'm a clinical nurse consultant with Malnica, um, five yoga gloves, the makers of. Uh, we're going to do latex free as part of your mandatory once a year, correct? So you may remember me from last year. I come here a lot um, because it's mandatory for all, so we go wind up doing it. So you may have seen this uh, program, but it's a great review. And I have to when? All right, we will shotgun through. All right, again, I am Rachel is your uh, new rep. Morning, morning. You used to have Jay. Um, Rachel's in Charlotte, so she is your local rep. Uh, again, uh, nurses from administrative. Nurses, you get two CEs for this. Surgical techs. AST surgical techs. We're going to... Um, Used to be able, I'm fighting with AST right now to be able to, to be able to give you CEs. They don't want anything for free for y'all because they want your money. Um, so, uh, surgical techs, you uh, you will learn something. That's the best I can offer you. But uh, nurses, you get two CEs. In the back of your booklet, they'll have three sheets of paper. One is your certificate. Keep that. Keep that for your records. I, and then the last one, you got two sheets. One is evaluation form. Room temperature was too cold, uh, audio visuals accentuated my learning, all that good stuff. Um, you have to put my name in there, last name Davis, D-A-D-I-S, first name Eric with a C. Um, and then on the very last one is your name, rank, serial number. Uh, if you don't know uh, your North Carolina um, license number, don't worry about it. Just put North Carolina. Just makes it more complete. I'll take those last two sheets of paper from y'all. And I will send those into Fiedler, register the course, so it's all good to go in case you get audited. Again, I'm an employee of Monica, as is Rachel, but we do all our education through Fiedler Enterprises through funds provided. Cool? cool. All right. Here's the objectives. In, in uh, basis of time, I'm going to skip the objectives because we're going to cover all of them as we talk through. Good? good. All right. Let's talk about latex <laughs> allergies. What is it? No distinction on race or gender, although ladies, you have a little bit higher predisposition than men. But, anyone can get it, men, women, um, creed, color, etc. And it can arise at any point. We all are different. We all have different immune systems. Some are more sensitive than others. You could be wearing latex gloves for 30 years like a friend of mine, and then one day she decided, that, her immune system decided that that was the day that it had had enough and now she is allergic to latex gloves, or latex, natural rubber latex. It is an acquired allergy, which means you have to be exposed to it to get it. Uh, kind of like pregnancy. So, um, that is why a lot of uh, young folks starting out in their career, uh, start their career with latex-free gloves, or uh, latex-free anything. Um, so, you have to have it, and again, we're all different. How you react versus someone else is always going to be different. And once you got it, you got it. There is no cure. There are strategies to help uh, prevent, but um, you know, acquisition of your allergy or, or exacerbation of your allergy. But once you got it, your immune system has memory, and there it is. This was a surgical glove market back in 1987 when I graduated from college. Now I dated myself. So. Um, and here it was in 2012. Where was the big upswing? What happened in the late 80s, early 90s? A, it required what from the CDC? Universal precautions. We went from 30 glove manufacturers to over 300. Not just surgical gloves, but exam gloves. Because we're using gloves for changing sheets and doing stuff that when I was a staff nurse, we didn't, uh, you know, we, we didn't do those things unless you had uh, poop or urine. So um, everyone was wearing gloves. A lot of the, so we went from 30 to 300. A lot of those companies that started to meet the demand were very uh, poorly regulated in terms of their quality improvement. And because of that, they were sending gloves with high, high, high levels of latex, natural rubber latex proteins in them. They didn't have a good quality control process exposing people to higher than normal levels of latex uh, proteins in the 90s. 
and that's where the big latex allergy brouhaha um, came about. There are some specific patients that are at risk and others that are, have a risk factor. One being uh, spina bifida patients actually have a genetic predisposition to having a latex allergy. They're the only known um, group that has a genetic predisposition. Um, but you also have to consider patients with earlier frequent mucosal contacts, people that self-cath themselves with rubber catheters, etc. Um, frequent users of the uh, medical system, multiple surgeries, there is no set number. Um, some unofficial ones say five or greater. Um, but anyone that says frequent user of the medical system are at risk. Uh, atopic individuals. Anyone know what an atopic individual is? I all talk to you about people who are different in their immune systems. Allergic to a lot of things. A lot of things. I'm sure you know someone that's allergic to perfumes, nickel jewelry, air, <coughs> water. Um, we had a patient allergic to water. Allergic to water. Yeah. Epinephrine, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so those people, you know, here's, do you have any allergies? That's an atopic <coughs> individual. So. Quick question. Yes, ma'am. Why is fine bifida? I can't more? tell you that. Why? But that, for the incomplete neural closure, but they are the only um, medical condition that has a predisposition to getting a latex allergy. Plus, they're frequent users of the medical system from birth. Um, so they don't know if the chicken came before the egg. But. There is a genetic predisposition. I do know that. So, um, it's early, so let's talk uh, labor and delivery. Um, women, I told you that you have a higher predisposition. 50% of um, anaphylactic latex reactions occur in the OBGYN and or labor and delivery. Why is that, you ask? No one knows. There are some theories. Um, again, 70% higher risk. Is it hormonal changes as we adopt our bodies for um, junior's arrival? Um, is a theory on that. Um, they do get multiple exposures to latex during their pre, uh, uh, <coughs> pre checks with, and if they're checking with latex gloves in a highly absorbable mucosal <coughs> membrane, they have an increased risk for absorbing natural rubber latex proteins. Um, and then there is a theory on oxytocin. Oxytocin um, has a very similar chemical compound. Don't ask me why. Um, but if you look at it, very similar to natural rubber latex. And there have been case reports. It hasn't been proven yet through a random clinical trial. But there, um, there have been case reports where everything's fine. And they push the pitocin. And lady goes into anaphylaxis. I wasn't allergic to latex, but which, which is it? So there's a lot of theories on that. I can't prove it. But um, again, more <coughs> anaphylaxis occurs in labor and delivery in OBGYN. For that reason, a lot of um, um, sole source women, women's hospitals, if you will, um, labor and delivery units in a, in a large facility go latex-free um, before the rest of the house does. Um, if you're going to learn anything, this is the one to know. Um, there are, because it's, it comes from a natural tree, the Havinia brazilianus tree, um, it has a very similar chemical composition, almost identical to what are the big ones that you see in, the, we call this latex fruit syndrome. So if your patient is allergic to what? Yeah. That's the number one that you hear all the time. <coughs> number two is kiwi fruit is the other one. Avocados is another one. But any of these are similar. We used to have a chart that showed highest risk to lowest risk in terms of biggest risk down to lowest risk. But anyway, if your uh, patient says that they're allergic to uh, uh, bananas and kiwis, your next question should be, are you allergic to latex? Um, a friend of mine is allergic to bananas and kiwis. And I said, are you allergic to latex? She said, oh, yes. So, um, and she was fine. She just happened to build over time. Um, but 
This is a big list. If you have patients that are reporting multiple fruit or nut allergies, should be a thing to raise the hair on the back of your neck and maybe uh, go on the, uh, um, you don't have time to all of a sudden do a latex allergy workup in the whole area, especially in an ambulatory place. Um, but you may uh, err on the side of caution and treat them as a latex allergy patient for that reason. For those of you that are going to take the CNOR exam, I do know that this is a, t a test question all the time. I remember taking it many years ago. Um, and uh, I was like, what did bananas have to do with, uh, I had no idea, but now I do. So, Other patients to consider, cancer chemotherapy patients, their immune system is altered um, due to the multiple stuff that they're taking. So they are at a in more increased risk um, than the average Joe. Asthma patients, we don't have to worry about so much anymore. That is a bygone of the powdered gloves. Who remembers powdered gloves? Do you have powdered gloves anymore? No. The FDA outlawed them last year. Only the second medical device that the FDA has ever outlawed, finally. Um, but they, you will not find powdered gloves anymore. But that, air, that powder would aerosolize into the air on those powder <coughs> granules that would carry um, the natural rubber latex proteins embedded in it. And you could uh, absorb it and irritate your um, bronchial tree. Transplant patients and organs. I know we talked about this last year. There is no uh, national uh, tissue bank has no guidelines on harvesting only with latex free. But there are case reports of um, took a kidney, went across town, put it in, harvested with latex gloves, went across town, put it in a latex sensitive patient, anaphylaxis. Deposited. You will notice on your little boxes of tissue that it doesn't say latex free. Now the tissue is processed. What's that? That just sucks. It does suck. But um, you will notice on your little boxes of tissue it doesn't say latex free. The tissue does get processed and most of the tissue banks will say that it's processed to the point where all the, you know, the minimal amount of natural rubber latex may, may remain but um, they can't put latex free. Is that going to be the next step? I don't know. I work with a transplant surgeon up the road. I'm from Richmond. Um, and he did all of his cases latex free because he didn't know what he was taking out, where it was born, and vice versa. He just, uh, that was just his way of, of doing things. And then, of course, you have any unconscious patient arriving in the ER. You can get metal alert bracelets that say latex allergy. But if you're not wearing it and you're unconscious coming in, sometimes it's best. You know, you don't know what you don't know. All right, let's talk about y'all. You all have an increased risk. Regular healthcare workers, anywhere from 2 to 17%. What's the general public percentage? Anybody? It's lower than this, but. One to 1.5%. Wow, why are we doing all this? There's only 1% of the general public is allergic to latex. Well, there's 333 million people. I take 1% of 333 million and I'm just walking out of the door right now. So there is still a significant, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot until you put it in, a, in, a, in the big picture. But regular healthcare workers are 2 to 17% just because of the nature of their work. Those with atopy, those are those people that are allergic to air and water. Um, obviously, it's going to be higher. OR personnel, obviously you're going to be higher um, because of that reason. And then one out of 50 healthcare workers on average become sensitized. And when I say sensitized, that doesn't mean that you get exposed. That doesn't mean you're in a full-blown allergy. That just means you're in a prodromal period where your immune system is getting accustomed to um, uh, having a, you know, it's building itself up. You, it, your eyes water, your nose drips, um, you're not flopping on the floor and, and going into a full convulsive, but um, that's just sensitization versus uh, allergy. And we'll talk about the difference. Uh, what about other places? Who else uses gloves? 
Yes. Pretty much everywhere. Now the food industry has changed pretty much over the years to usually, um, you see those, they use vinyl gloves. Not very durable. You don't see those in the healthcare arena because they're not very durable. But for making your sandwich at Subway, they're, they're fine. But most of the food, plus they're a little bit cheaper. So most of the food service area. But there was a time if you had a latex allergy and someone was preparing your food, especially on a place that you didn't see, you had to make sure that, make sure that they're using latex-free gloves because those natural rubber latex proteins can go into the food. And if you have an allergy, that's not a good thing. Um, but who else? We got police and fire department all carry gloves. I carry gloves in my glove box in case I have. No one else can say that. You carry gloves in your glove box? I have gloves in my glove box. Because you never know what you're going to run across. Exactly. I do carry free gloves in mine, just in case. Um, but, I also work for gloves. Um, but, first responders all have that. Um, tattoo artists, if that's your thing. Um, although they have to wear those black um, nitrile gloves because it looks more dangerous. Um, and then, uh, not that anyone in here would ever have their hair colored, but... Um, um, you know, your hairstylist, et cetera, et cetera, if you were to get your hair colored. I'm not saying that you would, um, but those are just other things to consider. So this is a Habinia brasilius tree. This is where natural rubber latex comes from and how we make gloves. One quart of latex gives about five pairs of surgical gloves, about 20 pairs of exam gloves. And you can see it's like a candy cane. See that uh, curly... Uh, uh, scar going down the tree. This guy will go out there with a knife and he'll basically pull the scab off and you can see the white liquid natural rubber coming down just like up in Vermont where they do syrup. It's the same process except it's manual labor. They have to do that every 24 hours. Every 24 hours that tree will bleed about a quart of latex and then it collects it in that cup, tosses it in the little milk jug there. In the milk jug they have ammonia that's to keep it from coagulating. So, um, collects all that and then they gets processed. So, what is latex? A milky liquid natural substance from rubber trees. Contains all this stuff. But what do we have to worry about? What is the stuff that causes the immunological memory? The allergenic proteins. There's 256 different types of proteins found in natural rubber latex. 56 can cause an immunological memory, and of that 56, 13 are the ones that cause you to flop on the floor and, and wiggle like a fish out of water. Those are the bad ones. Um, and that's what we have to try and get out of our gloves or whatever other medical device, and we'll tell you about another one. Um, so there are 40,000 different other uh, things with latex, including, uh, we'll get into the labeling requirements per the FDA. If you have a latex allergy and you rub up against a bus tire, why don't you flop on the floor like a fish? <coughs> the hard rubber, it's, usually, it's bound inside to it, so it isn't freely released, unlike flexible medical products like catheters, gloves, etc., balloons, or another one. Um, but I talked about those companies. We went from 30 to 300, sending over gloves that had high protein levels. There's a process involved when we make natural rubber latex products that helps remove some of that. But if you're not up on your quality control, one being um, these are gloves getting dipped into latex on the assembly line. There's like a thousand different hand molds that gets dipped down and runs along the assembly line. Um, but one of the things that the first thing we do is we leach it into hot water to help cool some of those natural rubber latexes out of it. Or proteins out. Uh, but if you're not changing your water, variation in your water temperature, and there's other chemicals that we use in both latex as well as latex free gloves in terms of the production process. Any of those variations can cause issues. There was a thing in uh, Puerto Rico where they had a drought and they were making the, uh, the tips on the fleet enemas, the ones you buy over the counter at CVS. That's natural rubber latex. Um, they weren't changing their water. So as they kept washing those as it, through the production process, the water was gaining more 
proteins in it. It was absorbing more. And they actually had um, five or six uh, anaphylactic episodes related to that fleet enema tip on patients. Um, because that is, last time I checked, a highly absorbable mucosal membrane. Uh, so your absorption level is higher than if you were to just do it dermally. Uh, we'll talk about some of the chemicals that we use. Sometimes we think we have a latex allergy, but it may not be. It could be related to some of the, pro the chemicals that we use. We have to add certain things to the latex matrix that tighten up the matrix and give it that flexibility, strength, etc., as well as increase the production time through the vulcanization of rubber that was invented by Mr. Goodyear. If you take latex paint from H Home Depot or whatever and you spread it on this table and let it dry and then you start pulling it off, what happens? Kind of pull it off in little strips. It doesn't come off in like a sheet, right? We add chemicals in that to tighten it up to give it that, that. So if you were to pull it off, it comes off in like a big sheet. So without the addition of those chemicals, A, you don't have the strength and uh, flexibility of your surgical gloves, which you like, or other devices. Um, but there's also, um, um, it also makes the process faster. Because if you were to do it one by one, um, you'd be uh, not in stock on a lot of items. So we have to add those chemicals. Those chemicals are added, we call them accelerants, accelerators, to help speed up the process as well as add strength. Um, those, are sa those same chemicals and accelerants are used in the production of non-latex gloves. So sometimes if you think you have a latex allergy and you switch to latex free, to, um, you may still have the same reaction. And there's a way that uh, you can be tested by an allergist if you say that you're breaking out because of them. They know the common ones to look for. We'll talk about that on the three different types. This is just the process uh, of how we make gloves. I won't get into it because it's really long, but the one thing I will tell you, the first thing we do is it, after, we, uh, after we dip and dry, it gets washed while it's still on the line. Then after it gets stripped, it gets washed two more times, as well as gets add some finishing agents, dries it, wash it again, wash it two more times. The water bill at our factory is over... Um, three million dollars a year in water only because of the um, because of this process so we do use a lot of water to make sure that we uh, are keeping up with our quality control these are the ways that you absorb it skin absorption obviously is the obvious way that uh, affects us in healthcare inhalation um, that was more of a holdover from the powder glove days that we'll talk about real brief Ingestion, I talked about where, you know, you can get natural uh, latex proteins on your food and absorb it uh, through your alimentary tract. Um, mucosal absorption, obviously, if you're getting uh, cervical checks done with latex gloves, etc. And I gave you the um, Fleet's Enema example. Intravenous, most uh, IV lines, you have to check that. And they'll usually say the inner, dynam inner diameter is latex free. I haven't seen... Uh, I don't believe I've seen any latex IV lines uh, out there that much anymore. The FDA does require that if a medical device has latex in it, natural rubber latex, um, that it has to have this uh, wording on there. There's plenty of devices, which I'm sure in your day-to-day -day <coughs> operations, you pull off the shelf and it doesn't say anything, and it doesn't say latex-free and you say, what the heck? Uh, and then you wind up calling the 1-800 number so that you can do that. I can't uh, speak for other companies, but I will say, if it does have that natural rubber latex in the device, that it has to say that onto the, on the packaging. Now, this does not mean um, things that you buy at CVS and Walgreens. It means it, products used in the healthcare arena. We used to make a low protein claim, but they've had us take that away. Um, and then we'll talk about powder gloves, but not long. Now, you see the terms latex free, non latex. The FDA made us change about five years ago because the, um, 
The material that we use in our latex-free gloves is a synthetic form of latex. Because it is synthetic latex, I can't say it's latex-free or latex or non-latex. I have to say it does not contain <coughs> natural rubber latex. You will see this term on some packages that say synthetic. It causes more confusion than help, but that's from the government. They're here to help us. Um, now they have allowed us, as of a year and a half, two years ago, to put the X um, with natural rubber latex with the cross through it. It doesn't say latex with the cross. It says natural rubber latex cross. So um, that is on the inner, um, the inner envelope. Uh, when you open the gloves and open up the package, that inner envelope, you'll see that on there. You may see that term synthetic on, um, <coughs> on some gloves, um, but if you do see that term synthetic, that's what it means. And if you do require any type of documentation on that, I can't provide that. So these are the uh, three types of latex. Or This one really isn't a um, latex allergy. It's more an irritant contact dermatitis. Temporary, usually goes away 24, 48 hours after you remove whatever it is that's causing your hands to break out. You can see where the cutoff is. This is kind of a holdout from the old powder days because the powder granules would get into any cracks and fissures in your, uh, in your hands, especially during the February months uh, when your hands were dry and chapped, etc. Uh, would get in there and have a more like a thermal reaction almost because it would rub and cause an irritant contact dermatitis. What else can cause an irritant contact dermatitis? Sometimes I get calls to say, hey, your gloves are making everyone break out. I've had five surgical techs come up to me and complain. Did you change the scrub sink soap? Well, yes, about two weeks ago we did. Really? Um, so, Again, all soaps are different, etc., but soaps are a common type as well as any type of lotions, emollients. I am sure that everyone in this room has experienced a minor form of irritant contact dermatitis on something that they didn't like. But once you remove the offending substance, it goes away. It's not permanent. This is the one that I was telling you about with the chemicals. Allergic contact dermatitis. <coughs> Delayed hypersensitivity type 4, for those that really want the big, uh, the big words. Uh, that is the one that causes an immunological memory due to the chemicals and accelerants used in the glove. The only way to know this for sure is to be tested by an allergist. Like I said, most allergists will um, have a common list of the common offending substances if you think you have a, a um, allergy to one of those offending substances. This does not go away. Your hands start to look kind of like alligator skin, or really break out, really red and nasty. Sometimes it can require um, antibiotics if it's that bad, as well as um, steroids. And sometimes this can cause a change in your medical career. There are gloves available if you are tested for this or your surgeon is tested for this that has this that do not have any of those offending chemicals in it. Are they the best gloves in the world? Really? Not really, but it's a glove. I say I describe it as a glove you have to wear, not that you choose to wear. Um, there are better. As time goes on, um, there are better and better options out there for that. But there are available for this. But once you have this, you can't get rid of it. Um, and then this last one, and this is most common to least common. This is the one where if I rub you with a uh, latex balloon, you're going to fall on the floor, and I'm going to have to put a $600 EpiPen uh, in you to stop it, the evil drug manufacturer. Yes. Um, that's, that's the one that uh, everyone thinks about when you think about latex allergy. So what are the consequences of latex allergy? Well, we're trying to avoid that anaphylaxis because we don't want that to happen, especially in the operating room especially in an ambulatory, because then they have to take a trip across the street. Um, but latex is the second leading cause of anaphylaxis in the operating room. First, boom. 
Number one cause is antibiotics or anaphylaxis. 6% of anaphylactic episodes end in death. Uh, and this one you've heard me talk about. Half of all latex-related um, allergic reactions occur during OBGYN. Um, career path, if you do get a latex allergy, what are some things that may, you may have to change your career if you don't have adequate things that are there? Uh, you'd be working in the quality department, gift shop, whatever. Um, that's a little bit drastic um, because there are options available to help you still work in, the, in your chosen profession, um, even with an allergy. Um, but 45% changed because of it, and that change can result. You lose a little bit of that overtime, weekend differential, et cetera, et cetera, because of it. Lifestyle adjustments, I talked about those with the sandwich. And then um, there are people that keep it quiet. Because the first thing I don't want to say when I show up to interview for a new job is, oh, yes, I just want to like to let you know that I'm late sex allergic. At which the hiring person goes, um, so I might want to keep that quiet. So some people do keep it quiet and just don't let me know until I got the job. I didn't say it was legal uh, from a hiring perspective, but some people don't want to let people know about it. Um, so powdered gloves, we're not going to touch on this. This is still, uh, we haven't updated the, um, uh, this is due for renewal. Um, but since the FDA last year, January of last year, outlawed powdered gloves. So powdered gloves are no longer. You won't find them anywhere. If you have a surgeon that has a box of them that he keeps hidden in his locker, um, be careful because the FDA, uh, are, because it is a banned device for the FDA, if the Joint Commission or CMS comes around and you're caught using a banned device, uh, I just throw that out there because there are doctors that when this was coming down, they were buying the last uh, two or three cases available um, because that's what they like. Um, but you cannot use powder gloves anymore. These are just examples of where the powder granules go all over it. Um, that's an epidural catheter, and those are the little powder granules you'll see as it was handled with powder gloves. Again, those, pow those powder granules absorb the natural rubber latex proteins, and thus when it aerosolizes, um, that's where it can get into your bronchial tree, eyes, um, go all over the room type of thing. Um, anyone guess what this is? Heating duct. Air ducts. They got rid of all their powdered gloves and people were still having some um, breathing issues related to that. They checked the air ducts. This was an old hospital, like 45, 50 years old. Um, and that is a collection of all the aerosolized powder over years and years. I didn't say that you had to get it done now. <laughs> Just something to consider. But this was, again, an academic institution. Um, been around for years and years and years, and that's what collected in their air ducts. So. Um, the reason they got rid of it is because it is a foreign body. It could cause adhesions, granulomas, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not going to dwell into this because it's no longer around. So any questions on powder? So ARN... Um, has two, two theories on latex allergy. They want to prevent complications in current latex allergic or sensitized. So if you got it, um, if you got it, we want to minimize your reactions to it and provide alternatives for you to work in a safe environment. And we want to prevent the development in the first place. Talk to a young resident, um, and she said that she wears latex free gloves, not because she had an allergy, it's because she didn't want to get an allergy. And that's kind of the trend I see with the young folk coming into the operating room, we surgical techs, nurses, or residents, that they're just going to latex free because it's on the shelf. Whether they have both choices available, they're wearing latex free for that reason. Um, don't tell this to the company, but I don't like this slide. Um, this one says that only 25% of healthcare workers check patients for health, uh, latex allergy. I don't think, I don't think. It's a 2012 study. Um, I think that y'all, I'm sure, do a very good job of checking for latex allergy. It's kind of, kind of the mantra now, correct? All right, so we won't dwell on that. Don't tell the company I said that. Um, 
there are certain policies who it still is in the ARN guidelines because they have not updated the safe environment for um, environment of care but um, we do the latex free patient the first case of the day right that's kind of a used to be who remembers that it's still in there why was that because the powder would settle all over, you know, and overnight it would all settle and we'd all do a horizontal damp wet down, you know, wipe down, et cetera, et cetera, so that there's less chance of powder picking up and causing, uh, you know, exacerbating a potential latex allergy situation. Do you see that nowadays? It's still in the guidelines. It hasn't been updated because uh, I don't know when it's up for renewal, but you don't see that now, especially in an ambulatory. I used to run an ambulatory. It's like, Mrs. Jones ain't here, get Mr. Smith. We're going. Um, because you just, you just can't do that. But that's kind of a holdover. There are places in Europe that actually use, um, they have a latex-free room. They do all latex-free cases only in that room. You're going to see that here? No, we don't have that You know, type of thing. Um, but again, it's just uh, those are the two things I wanted to talk about because a lot of people remember doing the latex free first case of the day. Of course, we got all the electronic medical records, all that flag, but there was always a time where you're talking to Mrs. Jones in the holding area and, oh, I forgot to tell you, latex balloons make my lips swell. It's not on here. Um, and then you have to scramble because now we've got a latex allergic patient because, you know, all the systems in place didn't work. So, 90% um, of latex allergic healthcare workers reported resolution of work related symptoms once they switched to synthetic gloves. That's not, not really an aha moment. Makes sense, doesn't it? 88% who had a positive. Now, they measure their IgE, interglobulin E levels, for latex proteins. You're never going to get rid of it, but you can by doing. Um, by limiting your exposure to latex, lower your serum IgE levels. You still have a latex allergy, but you can reduce the amount of interglobulin E floating in your system um, so that if you do get a minor <coughs> issue with latex, it's not going to throw you into a, a full-blown um, anaphylaxis. All these organizations have some type of latex guidelines, protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Do you all have a latex-free... Uh, policy. <clears throat> Most places are getting rid of it. Yeah, but uh, a lot of places don't have so much anymore. Yeah. Who, how about a latex free cart? Who remembers the day of the yeah, latex free yeah. cart that we roll down to room three? That's gone the way of the dodo. There still are places that I see with it. But it's very, very rare that I find it because most everything, what are the two biggest things in your modern operating room with latex in it? Catheters. And urinary catheters. Uh, there are some um, cardiothoracic type things, your Fogarty catheters. You got to check those. I got a question. Yes, ma'am. If you have a latex allergy, is it, does it appear when by latex or like it varies there it, are it can just be in the room and they can have the allergy um i have a uh it can do you follow what more, i'm asking what i'm getting at? more so from the powder gloves days because that would aerosolize and carry mm -hmm. um i do have a friend that has a latex allergy and she can't even be in the room powder free gloves but latex gloves she can't be in the room so that would cause she is She's one of those atopic weirdos that we're oh. talking about. Um, very nice. I'm very good friends with her, but I tell her she's a mess. Um, but she can't be in the room when they open latex gloves. She can't. So they can't even be open. But again, she's, again, everyone is different. Everyone is different. I can't say, that, you know. You yeah, I'm just asking because if you have a latex allergy patient and they're in the room and yet it's late discovery you've opened and, a yes. glove. Um, Again, it's but all you haven't varies. touched anything. It still can cause her problems. It can, but it bases on the patient. Okay, and that's pretty rude. It, it, that, and that's a far, you know, yeah. far end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
what we're talking about. Is something probably going to happen? Probably not, because they're probably in that spectrum somewhere. But it can. And again, it's more so from a, uh, a, a powder days that you had to worry about that, because that really did care. Well, my question was because, um, you know, sometimes you find out after you've opened up the table and the, the gloves are wrapped in paper, you can't just take them off. You have to tear it. Correct. The whole thing down. Now, that one I can, we'll talk about that just coming up right now. Okay. Um, about opening our late discovery, because technically that's latex on there. Is it wrapped in the paper? That paper has the latex proteins can be absorbed into that. Into it. Yeah, so do I just put a blue towel over it and we'll just roll with it, or do I err on the side of caution? I and just I, didn't know if you had to touch the patient that would start it, or is it it's just no. being in the room that can. It, and again, that's an extreme case. I'm not okay. saying that everyone is like that. But um, but if you have popped it up onto the field, and oh, Mrs. Jones forgot to tell you she's allergic to balloons, you got to pray for that all down, um, based on your policy, obviously. Um, <coughs> this is one of these uh, more advanced latex screening tools, because Mrs. Jones is allergic to balloons. Oh, or... I'm allergic to the adhesive on band-aids. You hear that one all the time, right? Well, are you allergic to latex? I don't know. I've never checked. What about your bra strap? The, you know, or um, your underwear? You know, because they have some of those have latex in it. Uh, what about this? Gets into a deep dive. This is not something you do in the hold area before you roll back with a cataract. All right. This is something that should be done in the pre-admission testing arena because. Yeah, I'm allergic to the, you know, the adhesive on those band-aids, but I'm not quite sure. I do kind of break out when I eat, um, my lip stingle when I eat bananas. You might need a little bit more of a workup, or you err on the side of caution and you just treat them as a latex. Again, this is very detailed and should be done not in the hold area, but in a pre-admission testing type thing, uh, and usually with an allergist. It has a lot of detail in there that we won't get into. Um, this is just uh, uh, one of the legal consequences, the patient reported that she was not allergic to latex. She wound up having an anaphylactic reaction in OBGYN OR. Um, wound up going to the ICU and expiring 10 days later. Did not have a latex allergy. She did say, I'm allergic to chestnuts. Where were chestnuts on that list of the fruit and nuts? It was on there. And a jury felt that there was enough um, enough there that they should have treated in a latex-free environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we got 4.7 for that. So, um, so what are the adv um, advantages to going latex? I mean, there's cost to treat the anaphylactic. There's workman's comp. If I develop a latex allergy while I'm, you know, in the in my employment, there are costs involved in that. OR teardown, like you were referring to right there. Um, plus the idle OR time. It just came out this week. What's the average minute cost of an OR? Cost per minute. 37 bucks. Based on a recent study just came out this week. Um, and you got to get, you know, you got to go find another pack. You got to go find another set because we don't flash. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And it ruins your whole day, especially in the world of ambulatory where it's high turnover. This is an example of um, the teardown that we were talking about. Mrs. Jones forgot to tell you, and you already opened everything because we're turning and burning. Um, they had, this hospital had an average of one teardown a week, late discovery. It costs about 300 bucks for the pack. Idle OR costs, talking about a 30 minute turnover, et cetera, uh, you know, at 37 or whatever the, the time that they use. And they had to go re-sterilize or have redundant um, instrumentation. Not counting if you have a loaner set that you can't flash, it has to go get processed again um, at about 30 minutes. By eliminating that one times 52 weeks a year of that, they were able to save $96,000 just by opening um, latex free. Just opening your case is latex-free until you get that verbal confirmation from the circulator that, hey, I talked to Mrs. Jones, we're good to go, you can pop everything else up. You guys have that blue underglove? Mm -hmm. 
We call that opening with Smurf hands. Because you have the green underglow. No. I think they have it across the street. That's latex. Whereas the blue is latex free. And it gives that visual indication that you can look in the room as uh, the tech or the scrub nurse is opening and you know that he or she is opening latex free. So that's why we call it opening with smart hands. And then once you get that verbal confirmation, we're good to go. Yeah, you can pop everything else off to help save you any of those um, <coughs> inadvertent teardowns. So um, neoprene is still around. That's been the old standard for um, surgical gloves as well as exam gloves. What else do we make out of neoprene? Wetsuits. Wetsuits. <laughs> So you know how, how, how giving that is. A lot of the more ne uh, newer versions of neoprene are much better now. Um, nitriles, the ones that you use at the bedside in the boxes, they're, they're durable, but they don't have a, any type of memory. So you, don't, you can get sterile ones of those. They're usually done for like um, cervical checks, etc. But where you don't need the, the um, tactile or um, sensitivity of a, of a surgical glove. And polyisoprene is the material that we use now. It's the synthetic form of latex. It is man-made, so there are natural, there are no natural rubber proteins in there to cause an immunological memory because of it. This is how the latex-free trend is moving through the United States. This is not a built uh, uh, Trump versus Hillary political map. Um, the red is greater than 50% of facilities are latex-free or moving to latex-free as part of it. And you can see this is 10, 11, 12, and 13. You can see that it's moving down from the great north down, down south. The south still used a lot of powder. But now that powder's outlawed, you can see that more and more places are going latex-free um, due to the um, things, due to these uh, advantages. Reduced OR teardown times, we talked about that. If you can eliminate your OR teardowns, then you don't have to worry about it. I, as a supervisor of an ambulatory place, I experienced, and I didn't know this because I was sitting in my office, because that's what administrators do. Um, um, but I didn't realize that it was up to five, we had like four to five cases a week that we were tearing down and grabbing another pack and just rolling with it. I didn't realize this. So that is a, an advantage. You don't exposing your workers, less workman's comp. Pediatric exposure, again, we don't, a lot of pediatric children's hospitals go latex-free uh, for the same reason that uh, labor and delivery does because usually these kids are getting welcome to the world, we're doing surgery on you, you want to limit their exposure so that they don't build up an immunological memory. We talked about lawsuits, workman's comp. Standardization, instead of having 20 different types of gloves, I can get you down to five. And then you don't have to worry, and these latex are latex-free, there is only one type of thing. Um, docs, a lot of the old guys still remember um, latex-free as the Playtex dishwashing gloves. We had to wear them because the patient was allergic and it's not something that I'm ever going to do. But again, with the advent of where we are with the newer materials, a lot of them, if you don't even tell them that they're not wearing latex-free, won't even know it. But um, it's becoming less and less again as more younger folks are moving towards that. This brings up that spina bifida case that we were talking about where they were treated again um, green being um, they were treated from birth in a latex free environment <coughs> and this is their latex sensitization still 5% had some but 55% if they weren't in a careful environment uh, still developed a sensitization allergy and allergic diseases because again you get their immune system going they're going to build up other things and this last one just talks about a, a labor and delivery OR um, where they didn't have any type of protocol in place and they had 2% um, anaphylactic reactions in the OR then they put in screening we're going to check the patients and do all this stuff and they dropped down to 0.6 once they went latex free in, the, in this unit they went to 0% um, did the patients change? No, but that's the one thing that they did do, and you can see the improvement. Last thing, and I'll shut up. This is Johns Hopkins up in Baltimore. You all heard of it, right? How many ORs do they have? 
about 80. Got a medical school, got residents, got fellows, got a nursing school, nursing school, got um, interns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How many gloves do they have in the operating room? Styles. Four. All latex free. And someone comes on, says, "Hey, I need the. This is what I got. Pick pick one of those four styles, and you're good to go." Um, now. Did that happen overnight? Heck no, it did not happen overnight. It was a phased process to be able to get them. But now, one of the premier um, places up in, in Baltimore, large, large academic institution, they got down to four gloves. It can happen. Um, this is just another, another example of that. That, folks, is it in a nutshell. Do I have any questions? I have a question. Is like to, to get latex free, is it more expensive? Is that why they, it's not? The material that we use is man-made. I'm not sucking it out of a tree. So yes, and there is a petroleum component to it. So when the price of oil goes up, um, but usually based on contracts, it you know can make it. But if you show those ex examples of if I can eliminate one tear down a week, if I was experience it, I save ninety six thousand. If I can eliminate three people, uh, of my staff members going to workman's compensation at a cost of blah blah blah, I can do a cost benefit analysis and show it. So if I can monetize those savings of that, um, I, I can you know show you that you're actually it doesn't cost more money. It's actually can it, or, or it can be cost neutral. Plus, you get the added clinical benefits of we're a latex-free facility. Well, that's not as expensive as it used to be when they had the old nitrile gloves, right? Uh, yeah. It's the, uh, less expensive than it used to be. As, as we have improved our product production and our materials, the cost has come dramatically down. And, to be honest with you, uh, there is competition among us versus others that uh, helps you in the long run. Um, so it really is not as prohibitive as it used to be used to always be a, oh, um, we can't do that. But now, um, with those advantages that I can show you, that it, it actually, if you can make it cost neutral, then it's, why, why aren't we latex free? It makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. You won't see a lot of the, uh, you'll see a lot of those Foley catheters um, for like the standard kits. Um, a lot of the inpatient facilities go to latex free with the silicone ones. They're a little bit stiff. Um, not exactly uh, the choice of urologists worldwide. They prefer their natural rubber so that it has a little bit more give to it. Having been, having been awake for my Foley, I do appreciate that. Um, the problem I have is that when you're wearing them, they're more slippery. I mean, they... Depends on which ones you're wearing. If you're wearing the blue ones, um, they are designed to be slick because they're designed as an underglow. You all have the orange package, yeah. sun-kissed orange. Mm -hmm. That's neoprene. Oh, okay. That is a neoprene. It's slippery. I mean, it, you're, just, you're just sliding along the instruments and stuff. That is a neoprene <laughs> type glove. It is not that um, that chemical-free glove. It does have a lot less. So some people that are a little bit more sensitive on the other ones can go to that. Mm -hmm. It's not a chemical-free one. We do make a chemical-free one um, like that. That's the only problem I have with them. Is it just, just not a lot of places stay with that skin sense. It's called skin sense. Skin sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the only one we got, I think. Um, yeah, it, 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 it okay. can be slippery, but there are other options available. I think they use them across the street. They should be available um, oh. in the system, if you will. Okay. I need those two sheets of paper, folks. Don't forget your um, certificate. Keep that. Please keep that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Sorry for we were late today. Sorry, yes. Blame it on the Back in 19, early 1960s. Okay. It's like for guys that are doing a, a hair plug.